Uh, welcome to Rush University Medical Center Division of Virology Renal Biopsy Conference for uh, July 20th, 2023. Today's CME activity code is 488887. Um, it is a case of Dr. Whittier's today. Um, this will be recorded. Uh, we have nothing to disclose as usual, and uh, patient confidentiality is very, uh, very uh, consciously preserved, and identifying information is removed. Uh, to, to protect their confidentiality, et cetera. Um, we put all your questions in the uh, chat uh, box. We have several polls today. Uh, I think we've got a fun case. And uh, Bill, you want to uh, take it over? Yeah, thanks. I, um, I would never be depressed, not, not given the good nature and give and take of the renal biopsy conference at Rush. I could never make me depressed. Um, so we'll start. Yeah, we've got a 71-year-old uh, Caucasian woman who has a past medical history of COPD, hypertension, and rheumatoid arthritis, who presents with a cough and dysphagia exertion and fatigue for about one month. Uh, she's had a poor appetite. Uh, about six weeks ago, she had uh, completed a um, hiking trip in Maine for seven days, but uh, denied any tick bites or exposures. Uh, she denies any skin changes, any fevers, chills, arthralgias, any abdominal pain, any change in bowel habits, uh, she's not had any weight loss. Her PCP about about two weeks ago prescribed a seven-day course of Augmentin, uh, which was completed about five days prior to admission, but this didn't really help any of her symptoms. So she uh, presented to the emergency room uh, because of her symptoms, and they had run a COVID test, which was negative. Her uh, 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 BNP, or natriuretic peptide, was normal, and her D-dimer was normal because she had been complaining of shortness of breath. Her uh, hemoglobin on emission was 6.6, .6, and her baseline uh, six months ago was 11.3 for hemoglobin, and her creatinine on emission uh, in the emergency room was 7.8, and six months ago when she had routine labs, it was 0 0.7. So she was started on IV fluid, she was given a blood transfusion, and then admitted for further workup. So her past medical history, I kind of already went over. She'd also had a previous colostectomy and uh, knee surgery. Family history is uh, unremarkable. She was a previous a smoker for 20 pack years, and that was thought to be the cause of her COPD, uh, denied any illicit substances or herbal medications. Um, on uh, her medications on arrival, she at home was on a meprazole, uh, thiazide at a very low dose, lisinopril 40 milligrams, albuterol, uh, leflunamide for her RA, and about five days ago was when she completed her seven day course of Augmentin. Uh, on arrival, her blood pressure was 140 over 70. The rest of her vitals were normal. Uh, she had slight ulnar deviation of her hands, uh, consistent with her RA. Uh, she had a two out of six systolic murmur. Uh, and her lungs were clear and her abdomen was soft, non-tender. She had no edema and her skin had no rash. Uh, her going exam was also normal. There was no synovitis. Uh, so her labs showed that her sodium was 133, potassium 4.1, chloride was 111. Her bicarb was 11, uh, the UN 75 creatinine of 8.15, uh, glucose was normal, her albumin was 3.3, calcium of 8.7, uh, LFTs were normal, her INR and PTT were also normal, her SED rate was 92, and her, uh, or sorry, her SED rate was 122, and her CRP was uh, 92. Her hemoglobin had a normal white count, or sorry, her CBC had a normal white count, but her hemoglobin was 6.6. .6 and her platelets were normal. Uh, workup for uh, uh, thrombotic uh, process or hemolysis was negative. Her ferritin was uh, over 1,000 and her iron stat was 34. Serologic workup, including an ANA, MPO, and PR3 were negative. Her SINP and UIP was sent and were pending. Her HIV uh, and hepatitis serologies were also negative. Her urinalysis had a pH of six, uh, trace protein, and it had uh, 38 white blood cells, and her urine culture was negative. Her phena was 6.5%. Her urine protein creatinine ratio was 243 milligrams per gram. Uh, chest X-ray and echo were normal. Her renal ultrasound was normal, except for a slightly increased uh, echogenic appearance. Um, in the hospital, when we met her, we started on AV fluids. Uh, we held all of her medications. Uh, her augmentin was already held, but we held basically everything else. And uh, her creatinine started to improve. It went from eight down to about five. 
or five and a half. Um, and then we had stopped IV fluids and started increasing steadily up to 6.2, again, from her baseline of 0.7 about six months ago. Uh, so that's when we uh, uh, intervened and did a percutaneous renal biopsy. Great. Any questions for uh, Bill Whittier? Did you like have a retic count? Uh, I can find that, Steve. I don't have it offhand. And you don't know if they did like a direct and indirect Coombs to see if she had evidence for an autoimmune hemolytic anemia? Uh, yes, that was negative. Uh, and I'll find the retic count. Uh, there were also no skin rashes. I see that in the chat. Yeah, I, I was going to ask the same relative question. What were the indices? MCV, MCH, MCHC. Do you know that, Bill? Uh, I'm, I'm going to look them up right now, and then I'll let okay. you know uh, once I get them here. Okay. Um, somebody asked well, about hemolysis about is not very likely with an LDH of only 141 with this degree of anemia, but uh, the question is, is this normal acidic and an aplastic crisis? She's got normal white count, normal platelet count, but it could be pure red cell hypoplasia. I'm sure I've got that her, her MCV was 102. Okay. Uh, her uh, RDW was 16.3. Um, okay. I'm going to have to find the retic count. I don't see it on the routine CBC, but I'll find that in a second here. So it's a macrocytic anemia. Yeah, she did have a B12 and a folate that were checked that were also normal. I didn't include okay. that. Uh, that kind of uh, suggests something going on in her bone marrow. Uh, the smear didn't show any nucleated red cells or any other features, Bill. Uh, it looked like a pretty normal. Yeah, that's smear. right. There were no, yeah, there was no cells uh, that okay. were atypical and uh, there were no reverse cells, anything that was abnormal on the smear. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Bill, you sound like Bane from uh, from Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else's microphone is beautiful. Um, sorry, I'm I'm in a Starbucks and I just couldn't get away to a better place. So sorry. You'll hear like somebody, you know, mixing a latte behind me. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're actually moonlighting as as a barista. I know. Um, so let's. We have a poll now. Um, we're going to start with a poll. So what your clinical diagnosis is, one, uh, RA-associated renal disease, two, interstitial nephritis, three, a renal-limited TMA, four, uh, MGRS, or five, ATN. Remember, your answers are uh, totally anonymous. Give it a few more seconds here. Yeah, give it more. We got sixty percent. Uh, Fifty-six people on, Bill. Pretty soon, yeah, you will get. You'll hit the magic number of sixty, and you can celebrate. If not, I'll log in twice. <laughs> Thank you. You guys don't want me on Prozac. <laughs> Actually, the wheel counts as one, and that might not. Uh, you know, so maybe we need sixty-one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, last second. Few more votes. All right. You should be able to see the results now. Okay, we've got a uh, few people with uh, RA associated renal disease, a couple with uh, MGRS, one with ATN. The, the majority of cases have to do with uh, interstitial nephritis and the renal limited TMA. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Gashti to tell us what he thinks and if thinks of any of these other uh, poll options are even reasonable to put on the poll. Casey? Yeah. <clears throat> so when I first was hearing about an elderly woman who's been fatigued with comes in with renal failure and pulmonary symptoms, I always think about vasculitis. Um, so that's probably the most common thing that, you know, unexplained reason for renal failure. That's what I think about. Uh, in this particular case, both the MPO and the PR3 are negative. 
but I suppose there could still be an anchor negative vasculitis. So that's still not completely off the list, but it knocks it down a little bit since there's a negative anchor. I don't see any meds that directly uh, are associated with like a drug-induced vasculitis. So, so vasculitis, I'm going to put it on the list. Uh, interstitial ne nephritis um, uh, would, would definitely be you know, somebody who's on a, a PPI, omeprazole, it's uh, it's definitely, uh, they can cause it. Uh, six months ago, the, the creatinine was normal. Now the creatinine is seven. So that, that could definitely be the case. I don't see any urinary findings that are, I mean, I guess there's 38 WBCs uh, so that, you know, there's some pyuria with a negative urine culture. So that, that adds up, I think. Um, no blood or trace protein. So that interstitial nephritis is definitely a possibility. There's this degree of um, anemia that seems to me that's pretty out of proportion to her degree of AKI when her hemoglobin was 11 something and now it's 6.6. .6. It seems that's a little bit too too uh, disproportionate, but I suppose that that could be seen or maybe there's a different explanation for the degree of anemia. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis definitely has been associated with um, vasculitis. So a uh, GN associated with RA, uh, you know, sometimes we think of RA as causing due to chronic inflammation, causing amyloid, but definitely rheumatoid vasculitis is on the differential. Um, we have a pending SPEP and UPEP, an elderly person with renal failure, although I don't see any hypercalcemia, but there is a lot of anemia. So uh, the anemia with renal failure in a 71-year-old, I would like to see um, the SPEP and UPAP result to see if there's anything that, that uh, monoclonal gammopathy that could explain a renal lesion such as a myeloma or an MGRS. Um, ATN is always possible. It seems like she's just been tired. Uh, outpatient ATN in somebody whose uh, blood pressure seems to be okay, 140 over 70. It, you know, I don't really see a good reason for her to have ATN, but you know we see that all the time where you can't really pinpoint the etiology, but clinically that's what the patient has. Looks like she has pretty good sized kidneys with really not that much echogenicity. So I feel, um, you know, I don't think that, th I think this is all just AKI. I'm not sure if there is any component of CKD. So um, I, feel, I feel about the same as the poll. I feel like um, interstitial nephritis is a good possibility. Rheumatoid vasculitis is a good possibility. Renal limited TMA. Um, I, you know, if this patient was was a stem cell transplant patient or uh, had a malignancy or was any on any kind of a medication that could cause TMA, or had really uncontrolled blood pressure, those would be some of the things that I would think about uh, for TMA. But uh, her platelet count is pretty normal, um, and she doesn't really have any. Uh, other kind of feature, there are no schistocytes, LDH is pretty low. So I, I don't, I'm not really uh, feeling strongly about TMA. So I'm going to go with vasculitis as my number one, interstitial nephritis as my number two. Um, and then uh, I think this this sort of unknown paraprotein with the SPEP UPEP pending, that would be my number three. So <clears throat> I'm going to ask you, uh, how do you, how, how do you put the vasculitis so high with that urinalysis? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I guess she has really severe renal failure. So, um, I'm not sure, you know, with the AKI, I, I understand, you know, you have to have like quite a bit of hematuria and here you have, you know, uh, dipstick is negative. So, you know, but clinically I feel like she's tired, she's short of breath, she has pulmonary findings and she has renal failure. So, ANCA is negative too. So, so I guess that's the other thing, but rheumatoid vasculitis, I guess ANCA could be negative, but you still should see hematuria. Um, yeah, maybe that, maybe the negative blood in the urine will, may knock it down to two interstitial nephritis number one, but they're, that's still kind of on there. I wouldn't be surprised if I see like a crescentic GN. So I see you're putting, obviously putting a lot of weight on systemicness and the anemia and, uh, you know, that's, to me, the uh, presentation and the story always trumps data. Uh, although obviously we take all of it together, but you know, data sometimes can throw you off. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, obviously, and mm -hmm. um, I mean that's why we have conferences and do biopsies and everything else. Um, the Boy, that, um, uh, the leukocytes in the urine and a very high leukocyte esterase is hard to ignore. 
uh, I would say that finding as solely due to vasculitis would be pretty exceptional. I must say, I, I that would be a new experience for me. Yeah, when I when I was you know putting together the poll for uh, you know what do you think is going on here here I you know I don't know this case obviously but I to me uh, agreeing with Dr. Glassick I assume that he's kind of thinking this is a primary and interstitial disease and and that's what I thought it was uh, it kind of screamed an interstitial disease to me there's a non anion gap acidosis there's low grade proteinuria there's a kind of a high urine pH and um, and uh, a lot of drugs that can do it, you know. Uh, she got some. She had some um, penicillin. She's on a PPI, as you said. Um, I think leflunamide. I think's been associated with it. I'm not sure. Uh, but um, and so I was kind of struggling to add other things. But you know, obviously that's why we do these conferences because we don't always know when we get fooled a lot of times. But um, so, Steve, what do you think's going on, Dr. Corbett? I mean, I, I the thing that stands out the most is this white blood count of 38 in the, you know, the the uh, pyuria, if you will, with essentially, you know, no protein or or dipstick positivity for blood in this acute event. I mean, I was sitting here thinking, here she's been up in Maine, who knows where she was. That's why I put it, maybe she's came into contact with, uh, you know, has a zoonosis like leptospirosis or something, which can have systemic manifestations and for sure can cause acute interstitial nephritis or shortness of breath. And, you know, I, and they can occasionally have anemia, but the anemia is the part that throws me off the most. Um, uh, and yes, as you alluded to, I mean, you know, Augmentin she'd been on, which can give you interstitial nephritis. There's no question the PPIs have all been associated with it. Um, I, I, I agree with you, Roger. I think this, I mean, at least for me, high on the list is interstitial nephritis. The only thing that throws me is Casey's been usually the guru of interstitial nephritis and for him to not put it up there is kind of making me nervous. But <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm on service. I'm disoriented. So ignore me. <laughs> so, You're never disoriented. So, so I know I, I, I mean, uh, I have a hard time making it a thrombotic microangiopathy. I guess, you know, I, I even have a hard time putting it into a pair of protein related form of renal disease. I, I'm probably going to take the bait here, but I think there's going to be an, an, a significant uh, acute interstitial nephritis. Um, I, I'm going to cling to some sort of zoonoses that she may have come into contact with like leptospirosis uh, as an unusual cause for her to have uh, interstitial nephritis and these other systemic manifestations. Again, the anemia, which you, you know you can see with the leptospirosis, but very, it's not real common. And usually they have anecteric uh, elevation in liver enzymes, which she doesn't really have either. So I don't know. I mean, I it, it is interesting. The LDH is normal and the haptoglobin is normal, but that just usually implies to me that she doesn't have any intravascular hemolysis. If you have immune, you know, if you have antibody mediated uh, hemolysis, you know, where the red cells are being plucked out by the, by the spleen, I, the haptoglobin is not going to be low generally. And I don't know, Dick, I, I, I had, was trying to rack my brain to think whether or not the LDH would go up in that situation. For sure, with intravascular hemolysis, it would. But I, I don't remember whether or not with, uh, you know, uh, immune-mediated uh, Coombs-positive hemolytic anemia, whether the LDH goes up too or not. Yeah, I don't think so, because it's I, all taken I out of the system. I think Bill is, or Steve is on to something here. Uh... Lyme disease can cause hemolytic anemia, and we haven't excluded that because we don't have a retic count and we don't have a Coombs test. Mm -hmm. And uh, extravascular hemolysis may not change the LDH in the way that intravascular hemolysis. Yeah. So I think, uh, I must say, I, I might even consider Lyme disease even in the absence of the rash because yeah. she's been in the high-risk area hiking, a lot of people don't remember any skin bites. Uh, I would I would begin to put Lyme pretty high up on the list here. Dr. Suki points I would out do the serolo I would do the serology at least. Dr. Suki points out she was treated for Lyme. I guess that means that uh, that augmentin treats Lyme, but I don't know how well that is. Yeah. No, did, didn't she get doxycycline or something? She got augmentin. We okay. got augmentin, but augmentin does treat Lyme. The first line is doxycycline for 10 days, but augmentin does treat it as well. That's a good yeah. point. Before I, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, 
Dr. Rubin had a question. Before I uh, um, hand it over to him, you know, I remember the time when anemia was just not thought to be part of uh, AKI. In fact, you know, the, re the really old days before we had good ways of patient presents with renal failure and and uh, you know we weren't necessarily looking at some of the other things. But one of the one of the axioms. This is a long time ago. Is that anemia? Depending on how anemic they are, if they're very anemic, they're it's probably CKD and not AKI. But I think that's been thrown out, and I think you can see definitely see anemia with AKI. I've seen it drop very quickly. However, this is really out of that kind of. I have to agree with everybody. This seems a little bit out of the realm of it, the AKI anemia. So, um, yeah, the whole issue of, there is the, the the lifespan of a red cell, right? Yeah. You know, for, for uh, chronic kidney disease is one thing, but for acute renal failure, if you have acute kidney injury and your creatinine jumps up very quickly, I mean, the red cell half-life is like yeah, but, 60 days. Yeah, but I, 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 I can get you the literature on that, even though that makes a lot of sense, and that was what we kind of stuck with forever. I don't think it's unusual to see very, fairly significant anemia in AKI now, maybe just Rel relative to everything else that's going on, inflammatory state, whatever else, not necessarily blood loss, but it's just, you know, that's, that's kind of been thrown out, but I don't think a hemoglobin of 6.6 .6 is uh, still a big red flag in this case. Dr. Uh, Rubin, you had a question? No, I had a comment. So oh, well, excuse me, Dr. Rubin, do you have a comment? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the other take I have, which was also mentioned by the discussion and you put it in the poll is an elderly lady with, who is super inflamed. Look at her CRP, ESR, ferritin, uh, profound anemia. She lacks what we used to call a leukoerythroblastic picture on her smear. But as Dick pointed out, the macrocytosis indicates a marrow problem, then significant kidney size, uh, which may indicate an infiltrative uh, kidney disease, such as a leukemia, lymphoma, or any other dysproteinemic disorder, which may also lead to the sterile pyuria. So I'm eagerly awaiting for further data, and of course the biopsy, but I will put a dysproteinemic disorder number one. Macrocytosis in somebody that's reticking, you know, can just be a result of the of the uh, the larger size of the reticulocytes. Now, interesting, Bill's got it down here is is uh, three percent, but if you correct that, it's really not that high. So I, yeah, the reticulocyte index, as uh, you know, Steve, doesn't yep. make it. Yeah. No, you're right. Sorry, all good points. Uh, let's move this along. We have a second poll. Um, uh, do you want to pull the, well, you could look at the slide, but I, right now the slide is still poll one on, on the screen. Okay, what would you do first? Now, let's just be honest. I know this is biopsy conference, but what would you do first? Would anybody just give prednisone and watch? Uh, would they do a renal biopsy? Would they do a bone marrow biopsy? Or would they phone a friend? We may have to specify who the phone a friend is in this today. <laughs> For this poll. Actually, uh, you know, what is phone a friend? I mean, obviously, you know, from uh, the show, uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? But I think the uh, the real equivalent of phone a friend is, is when you post something in the ASN communities. That's when you're, mm -hmm. um, which Dr. Glassick and I always enjoy good questions in communities. So um, prednisone and watch, empiric or renal biopsy, bone marrow, go directly to bone marrow biopsy, or um, thank you for the one person that phoned a friend. It's probably right. Bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a uh, good. Yeah, it's pretty overwhelming good. that people would do a renal biopsy. But you know, I have some takers on giving uh, just empirically treating, I think that uh, I mean, generally, we don't do that, but, it, it, you know, I put that in there because originally, you know, my bias of poll number one was like, it's kind of hard to think of anything else, but interstitial arthritis in this case. Um, I could have said give prednisone only and, and stop, stop agents is probably what I said, stop the other drugs and give prednisone, but I think you got the idea. So, uh, three, four said uh, uh, to do a renal biopsy, which is what we did, of course, since this is biopsy conference and not prednisone conference. 
<laughs> and uh, let's see. Let's see what the wheel says here. The wheel up. Where is the wheel? Oh, wait, you know what? I got a oh, question for Bill. Hold on. Uh, can I uh, ask Bill a question before we proceed? Ready. Uh, patients with anemia of this degree, according to what you've written, are at increased risk of uh, potential complications from a renal biopsy and blood transfusion is often recommended, I think, in patients with hemoglobins under seven before you do a biopsy. Uh, is the nature of the anemia important? I mean, is it more likely a risk in hemolytic anemia than it is with a bone marrow? I mean, are, is this just anemia as a general phenomenon? Yeah, it's a good point. I, and and the, the short answer is that we don't know. We know based on studies that a low hemoglobin is okay. a risk factor. And there's there's some thought that anemia does increase your risk of bleeding and iron deficiency actually does increase your risk your actual bleeding. Uh, but when we try to stratify by um, hemoglobin levels and how far they actually dropped, in our hands, it looked like transfusions were given more so for just a drop in a mild drop in hemoglobin and a hemoglobin threshold as opposed to an actual bleeding event. So if someone dropped from like 13 to 10 and they actually had a big hematoma, they may not have gotten a transfusion. But if someone drops from 7 to 6.8, they get a transfusion, even though they didn't really bleed. Uh, and so that's the, kind of the conundrum of using transfusions as a definition of complication. And um, I wrote, an, uh, we, I can send out that article that we kind of did that to prove that it was fun. But different anemias, we don't know if they have different uh, bleeding risk, which was your original question. No, but the, the, the issue of transfusing up, you know, some people think by being anemic, there's an increased potential just independently of, of having a, a more platelet dysfunction. And since most places don't look at bleeding times to or evaluate that, it's hard to know. But you know, the whole issue of transfusing up a little bit, it was to try and improve the rheology and theoretically improve platelet function. And that's why I think, as you say, some people suggest if they're really anemic, give them a unit or two of blood just to get them up over whatever the threshold mm -hmm. that's been arbitrarily picked. But as Bill says, it's pretty it's pretty soft stuff. Well, I think Dr. Glassick for I think Dr. Glassick for the question because that gave me time to uh, put the wheel back on who had <laughs> rejected the conference. It was uh, mad because we waited so long for it. So <laughs> here's the wheel. Hamoud. All right, Hamoud. Uh, give me a second uh, here. Second year fellow. Um, let you unmute yourself here. I'm going to give me a second. All right, let's test your audio. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, good. And Perfect. Then... You don't sound like Bane. <laughs> uh, I'll give you control here. Uh, go ahead and click on the, the screen. Yep, you're controlling the screen. Go ahead. On the left, uh, bottom left. Yep. I actually don't see the arrows, but. Um... Here. Uh, there we go. Go ahead. Let me see if I can just. The blue. I'll try to use my keyboard, I guess. Okay. Just use your keyboard. Be careful yeah. not to advance it too quickly. Yep. Okay. So here we have the one core. Uh, this is a trichome stain. I'm uh, looking for the blue staining, some chronicity. So I do see some in this area here, here. And then I also see a few glomeruli here, here. So I guess overall, uh, maybe 30, 30% or 40, 30% and some like in focal areas. And the tubules, I don't see tubules being like two back to back. So when we see a closer look, might have a better idea what else is going on in the interstitium and stuff. Uh, but I think that's that's what I see here. Yeah, the trichrome is going to be a little misleading in this case because um, we could go go forward to the next stain because um, some of this is edema. Hmm. Okay. It, there you go. Makes it a little more obvious what, yeah. what's going on here. 
Yeah, so a little closer look here, we have an H&E stain. Uh, I see a few glomeruli and uh, from here, it's hard to say if there's anything along the look more or less normal from this area, but I do see a lot of areas of uh, infiltration. I see cells in the interstitium, and as you mentioned, with some edema, uh, the tubules are definitely not back to back. Uh, so there's a lot of interstitial inflammation going on. Uh, I see mostly in this area, some in this area. Overall diffused maybe, but uh, uh, in, in between focal and diffuse, I'm not sure how to describe this, but uh, definitely more hair and more hair. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it looks uh, diffuse uh, and, and dense, dense interstitial infiltrates. Yeah. Um, Okay, so here's a close-up. We are still on the HNE &E stain, uh, focused on our glomerulus. Uh, regarding the glomerulus, I don't see any like much uh, mesangial expansion, no hypercellularity. Uh, the loops, for the most part, kind of. I think they they look open, kind of in the middle, maybe. Uh, for the most part, they look open. I, I think these are red cells there, and I don't see any. Yeah, I mean, the glomerulus looks uninvolved. All the activity yeah. is around it. What do you see going on around and the there is, uh, In terms of uh, tubules and the interstitium, the interstitium has a lot of uh, cells, inflammatory cells. Uh, they look like uh, lymphocytes and maybe this one, I don't know if this is like multi-lobed neutrophils. Uh, this yeah, it looks like a mixed infiltrate. Yeah, mixed, like you said, yeah. I see it can make out lymphocytes, some neutrophils. I see plasma cells, cells too, right? Plasma cells, yeah. uh, rare eosinophil. Yeah. yeah, so it's kind of a mixed interstitial inflammation more on this side than in terms of the tubules. Uh, see like a lot of sloughing here, here. Uh, some of the brush borders are off. Uh, so some level of APN maybe as well. Yeah, uh, it's good. But mostly interstitial inflammation uh, mixed, as you said. Yeah. This this is an eosinophil? Uh, probably on the other side of the tubules, a little bit better. Oh. And when we'll see some at higher, we'll see some at higher power. Yeah, but we'll wait to go high power. Okay. And so this is a PAS stain. We see the uh, glomerulus in the middle. So I'll be just very quick. Grossly, I don't see any pathology in the glomerulus right now. Uh, the membranes, they look fine, not thickened or anything, and no cell hypercellularity or mesangial expansion or scarring, obvious that I can see. Looks intact. Again, in terms of the interstitium, uh, I'm guessing this is like some, I don't know if this edema or fibrosis, but pinkish material. And yeah, again, probably a little, little fibrosis setting in there to the right. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then I, again, I see uh, cells, which we saw better in the other stain. And then in terms of the tubules, again, stuffing uh, here, like it's totally kind of destructed. Then loss of brush border, again, stuffing. So some level of ATN and uh, again, interstitial uh, Inflammation, uh, inflammation. Yeah, good. On the left is a good example of how you would have edema because those aren't atrophic scarred tubules yet they're separated. So by the, uh, yeah, by the interstitial infiltrate separating the tubules apart. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Here we have a silver stain. Uh, again, for the most part, uh, I think it looks okay. Uh, not suspecting anything, no spikes, no uh, break that I can see. Um, right, yeah. yep. No Basically, the membranes are smooth, no, no glomerular pathology. Yeah. Well, okay. So, again, a lot of interstitial inflammation here. Uh, I feel like I mostly see lymphocytes. Okay, here maybe are these eosinophils? 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can see areas of dense intensity uh, and um, we'll go. Yeah. Next slide. We'll go higher power there. Okay. You can see it. it and again, this is like uh, some fibrosis or the pink. I think we're, we're in the medulla here. Oh, okay. Yeah. In hard power region, is thin, and here uh, can kind of appreciate these lymphocytes, uh, lymphocytes, eosinophils, and to look for any neutrophils, multilobular. Yeah, so some areas had prominent eosinophils, other areas were more mixed, like we saw on the previous slide. Oh. A top right tubule, mm -hmm. good, a good example of tubular necrosis. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, sloughing of necrotic cells in the lumen. And then one other thing, the tubule like at around 12 o'clock, okay. yeah, there's active tubulitis going on there. Do you see the oh, lymphocytes yeah. actually attacking? Yeah, right Thanks. there, lymphocytes attacking <clears throat> the tubule. So that's active tubulitis. That, that's really neat. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but then compared with this one, then here, yeah, more. okay. Back to PAS, uh, I guess this is mainly for a lot of tubular destruction, the ADN part. You have a lot of sloughing of the cells. Uh, is this still sloughing or this is some other material? Yeah, and then the intratubular necrotic debris. Necrotic debris, okay. There, although I see tubules are kind of closer relatively in this section. Yeah. The, the, the interstitial nephritis was a little less intense in this area. Right, yeah. Uh, but definitely ATN going on, a lot of destruction. Yeah. Okay, so we're at immunofluorescence, IgG negative. Yeah, everything completely negative. Oh. There was, there, we didn't get an EM, a, a glomerulus for EM, so. Okay. So overall, we have uh, acute on chronic interstitial nephritis with associated with some ADN as well, um, with 20, 30% IFTA. Yeah, good. And a lot of eosinoph a lot of eosinophils, which may or may not point towards something, and actually some plasma cells as well, right? Mm -hmm. no, yes, yes, yes there were say... focal plasma cells. Kidney biopsy doesn't get you much closer to the diagnosis. <laughs> well, it often doesn't in this uh, with 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 that. Well, pattern. it's a it's a nice example of interstitial nephritis, but uh, we're after a diagnosis here, and we've got this huge anemia problem sitting in the background here. Uh, more I think about this, so with all this inflammation, I wonder whether this is hematophagocytic uh, disease. Uh, be nice to have a ferritin level to see whether or not she's got hyperferritinemia, but yeah, I, don't yeah. I don't understand the anemia. Yeah, doc, Dr. Friedman had brought that up in the chat, uh, that possibility. Uh, yeah. uh, Mario? No, I was pointing out to Dick that there is a high ferritin level in this patient. I, I don't know what the ferritin is. It wasn't in the protocol. Yes, it was. Was it? Yeah, I missed it. Yeah, it was, it's okay. It was it was thirteen hundred about. It was oh, thirteen hundred. I'm sorry, I missed it. It's not dead. Man. Oh, okay. Well, it's not four thousand, but that's uh, <laughs> that would be uh, not inconsistent with a hematophagocytic uh, disease, which can be a complication of many viral illnesses. Uh, anyway, I I think I, I would have uh, loved to see a bone marrow to see whether or not they're the macrophages in the bone marrow are chewing up red cells. Yeah, I think uh, it's not 4,000 is what I'd hang yeah. my hat on. <laughs> right, I'm but, sorry, I missed the term. No, no, not at all. We miss things all the time, but uh, but uh, not at all. But uh, yeah, I kind of not impressed by that ferritin, but you know. Um, so uh, for the sake of time, uh, I think we have discussed, you know, our thoughts about how the biopsy did or didn't help us. Let's uh, hand it over to Bill. Sure, uh, Praveer, you wanna... So this was the workup so far. The SIEP and UAP came back uh, as negative for any kind of monoclonal protein. Um, the infectious workup was completely negative, including 
TB, Lyme disease, viral and fungal uh, cultures. Uh, they did a dilated fundoscopic exam since there was interstitial nephritis here thinking about TNU and that was also normal. Uh, ACE level and IgG4 level were also both normal and her chest X-ray, uh, CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis were all uh, normal. Um, that was the further workup that we had. And they also did a lot more workup uh, serologically for anemia. They did, you know, lead and copper and zinc and, you know, all these tests and histoplasmosis and, you know, every single thing that you can kind of think of serologically uh, to try to evaluate for uh, other causes of anemia. They did not do a bone marrow. Uh, so, sorry, I guess we'll keep going with what we did. So what we did is the antibiotics were held, the PPI was held, and we started on prednisone 40 milligrams a day. Um, maybe next slide, Prabir, if you can do it, or do you want me to do it? Yeah. So um, we started on prednisone, and the, the yellow is uh, the hemoglobin, and the blue line is the creatinine, and so she was in you know renal failure there. But after we started prednisone, both the hemoglobin and the creatinine got markedly better. We did about 40 milligrams for one month and then tapered her prednisone off. Uh, and uh, she was doing pretty well, next slide. But as soon as her prednisone was tapered off, uh, and it was a pretty good dose and it was a pretty good um, duration, uh, she became markedly anemic again, uh, down to seven and then 6.6 .6, and her creatinine had gone from two to 3.7. It's a pretty rapid drop in hemoglobin again. It's kind of, a, yep. you know, gets back to what we all, everyone just keep harping, harping on, uh, that profound uh, anemia. Uh, no iron deficiency, no blood loss, nothing like that. So, um, you know, I think it also gets back to what Dr. Glassick said. We have interstitial nephritis, and, and just the fact that this would have responded to steroids doesn't give us a diagnosis. Um, so let me... Uh, uh, have poll number three. Now, would you, uh, would you number one repeat the renal biopsy? Uh, two, just reinitiate steroids. You know, sometimes uh, we didn't treat long enough or whatever. Uh, now, do a bone marrow biopsy or again phone a friend. Yeah, Dr. Reem brings up sarcoidosis in the differential, and that certainly was on our uh, radar uh, with the interstitial nephritis. I mean, with the medication history of the recent augmentment also being on a PPI, I wasn't too surprised that it might have been drug-induced interstitial nephritis. Obviously, since she didn't reinitiate any medications and her you know, anemia came back and her renal failure got worse off of those uh, agents and she didn't restart them, then it, what, those weren't the cause. Uh, so then, yeah, I was really a little bit more worried about sarcoid. Her ACE was negative, her chest x-ray was negative, but that doesn't mean she uh, doesn't have sarcoid. No, but she didn't have eosinophilia, she didn't have hypercalcemia, she didn't have really anything else to go along with it, right? That's right, that's right. The thing I'd say about that, though, is that the patients that are hypercalcemic and whatever else have chest x-ray abnormalities, they never come to nephrology for diagnosis anyway. I, I've seen a number of these renal-limited sarcoid kind of cases and they and the reason I have seen them because they don't have obvious sarcoid. Um, the only thing I would say, and this is really pretty sketchy, is that uh, I know ACE levels are not very, a very good test for this, and maybe it's a selection bias of who I've seen. But it would be hard for me to believe that you could have this much renal disease from um, from sarcoid and not have an elevated ACE level. They're always elevated in the cases I've seen, but again, that may be. Uh, a selection bias because those are the ones I'm identifying. But, and and uh, there were no granulomas, right? There are no granulomas in the kidney, no. Yeah. But again, I, you don't always catch those. I've seen cases where uh, they just have bad interstitial nephritis and, um, and um, ACE level and maybe some uveitis or something, but, but, but no granulomas. So I don't, you know, it'd be nice if you have all that, but you don't. And so sometimes sar renal sarcoid becomes kind of a clinical diagnosis and maybe it depends on how much you're lumper and a splitter and everything else. Um, so uh, we have... Uh, Finally, an overwhelming answer here. We've got 70% of the people say a bone marrow biopsy. We've now have two more people phoning a friend. God bless you both. And, uh, but good. I mean, you know, 20% said, well, we should just restart steroids. Um, respond to steroids, restart steroids. Uh, the, everything got better. It's not a, you know, a, a crazy 
reason. It doesn't give us a diagnosis, however. So, Bill, are you going to be able to give us a diagnosis? Yeah, so we did a bone marrow biopsy here. Uh, David, do you want to read this, if you're still on? Well, the marrow showed uh, normal cellular marrow with trilineage maturation. Uh, I have the report here. There's no tumor dysplasia or increase in blasts. There was a focal non-necrotizing granuloma, as you see here, collection of epithelial histiocytes with some lymphocytes. How about hematophagocytosis? Not, uh, not noted not seen. in the report. Not seen. Yeah, it was not seen. Hmm. So is that a granuloma in there with, with a giant cell in the in the yeah, bottom yeah, right? Yeah, the granuloma is in the bottom. Oh, bottom the bottom right, right is the granuloma, uh, okay. Epithelioid histiocytes. Yeah, that's the granuloma there. Okay. No asteroid bodies, right? Uh, no. All right. I can't, I, I can't put my finger on it, but there's a cell over here on the at 11 o'clock up in the upper left quadrant with a red appearing thing in the cytoplasm. Uh, what is that? And over here on the three o'clock on the fringe of the biopsy, there's something that looks like a red cell inside of the I, you sure there's no hematophagocytosis in this bone marrow? Well, I'm not a hematopathologist, but yeah. the, the one that read this has about 20 years of experience. Okay. He, he didn't know. All no, right. I'm not no gonna... comment on that. No. Okay. I, I would have to defer to him, but I didn't. I don't see okay. anything. But Dr. Vlasic, absence of uh, phagocytosis in the bone marrow doesn't uh, actually rule out. There are a few patients which will be negative on bone marrow, you still yeah. can have macrophage activation. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, but I think with the, the finding here that's, you know, yeah. obviously in the slide is this granuloma. And so, yeah. um, Bill, did this help? Did this, did this help you? Well, yeah, it really did. Because to me, uh, you know, my initial, initial suspicion of uh, drug-induced interstitial arthritis, uh, you know, now this took it to a new level because uh, again, no, no recent drug exposure. And now you've got this endogenous granuloma, and this is very likely what was going on in the kidney in the absence of prednisone again. So, so, you know, it, it's difficult to know what to call this. I mean, is it something like sarcoid? Is it something like IgG4? It's clearly an interstitial process. that's destroying her bone marrow and destroying the kidneys. Unfortunately, we know it's uh, prednisone res responsive. Now, even though we didn't see granulomas in the kidney, because the granuloma is here, you could argue that this might be a case of granuloma dysfunction arthritis, again, in the absence of naming those things. And, and we've already talked about this, but maybe the next uh, slide here, Prabir. The What we did with her next was we put her back on prednisone, but this time I did a little bit of lower dose because I added some MMF. Um, I checked in with a hematologist and said, you know, what's your differential for granulomas in the bone marrow biopsy? Is there a specific treatment that you would suggest? Because a lot of the interstitial nephritides that I treat uh, I may use uh, methotrexate or maybe, you know, you know when, I'm, when I'm done with steroids or I want steroid sparing, but because of her profound anemia, I didn't really want anything else that could suppress the bone marrow as much as imuran or uh, possibly methotrexate. So we chose MMF and we tapered the prednisone pretty quickly. And fortunately, her anemia responded again and her serum creatinine responded again to uh, up to 1.7 uh, several years out. And she's on MMF still and off steroids and she's doing quite well. Um, her C ESR, her CRP, her ferritin all kind of came down. Um, and so, so, you know, my differential here is really the same differential that we talked about, if we could advance one more. And that is the same differential of interstitial, granulose interstitial arthritis. So one more. And it's kind of everything that we talked about here. There's drugs, right? There's analgesic drugs, uh, all sorts of drugs that are associated with this. Most common being the antibiotics, of course. Um, but then there's these infections and inflammatory rheumatologic issues too. Sarcoid and Tinu uh, being number one. Uh, Dr. Gashi had a case of um, a Crohn's disease associated with it. And of course, we know about the vasculitides that are associated with it as well. Um, it, it, of all the infections, I didn't see or couldn't find Lyme disease as one of those, but that doesn't mean it can't. Uh, and tick-borne illnesses are up about 30% 
uh, right now in uh, in America and in the Northeast. And so I'm not sure. I mean, we tested her for that and it was negative, but that still doesn't mean that she didn't have something like that. So so right now we've got her on the cell stuff and she's doing pretty well. And I think she's sort of in this realm of uh, green luminous interstitial and Friday and, and this is the differential. We've tested everything we think we can for. Her. Um, and fortunately she was is responding to our therapy. So yeah, um, this, you know, it just doesn't really help that much, but I mean, it's just sort of a presentation of those and how you can try to differentiate the, the different causes. Go ahead. Uh, what did he, what is, what, what did he say about all this? Yeah, they, they said it's very unusual to see granulomas in the bone marrow and they basically gave the same differential that we did IgG4 uh, possibly sarcoidosis in fact that was the only two things in the differential that the hematologist told me I was like I, I know those thank you uh but can we come up with a little bit broader of a differential and um but really you know they and I, they had tested for so many different things um uh, as causes but they were pretty perplexed too but I think that this is really what's going on in both organs and going on in our whole body well, that's certainly Occam's razor would say that, you know, whatever's, you know, what you see there and it, it responded to steroids and um, whatever you want to call this, um, you know, it, it clearly is an inflammatory response. And it really, I mean, incredibly inflammatory when you look at that hemoglobin drop, when you look at the, uh, the sed rate and some of the other things that were pointed out, just how systemically ill this patient really is, um, which was Dr. Gashi's original point about pointing him towards a systemic disease and not just you know, a drug-induced interstitial nephritis. Um, but it's remarkable, actually, too, how steroid-sensitive, you know, literally a month, everything got better twice. Um, and, uh, you know, the second time it was 20 milligrams a day plus MMF, and now you're going to just, you're going to plan on keeping her on MMF as a maintenance drug? You're muted, Bill. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to keep, I'll probably, I don't know. I was going to go for about 18 months and then I might cut down to low dose and then see what happens to her hemoglobin. I don't really want her to be on MMF for life, but if she needs it, she needs it. Uh, so yeah, play I think around with it. Yeah, I think that's quite reasonable. Um, you know, you wonder what, you know, what something like rituximab, you are rituximab, by the way. I'm surprised you didn't opt for rituximab. Uh, I guess you're now, you're, you're growing. <laughs> I'm, I'm susceptible. It sounds like susceptible. I'm susceptible to <laughs> changing my, uh, changing my therapies. Oh, that's great. Um, Archer, I have a question for Bill. Um, so I seem to remember that Jerry Appel published many, many years ago, their experience with the use of cell sap in corticosteroid resistant. Mm. Uh, interstitial nephritis. Uh, has there been any additional data on this approach? Because I haven't seen any, and I'm interested to know what your thoughts on discovery were. Uh, you know, I'm not aware of that paper, and I have to go look it up. So thanks for bringing it up. I just wrote it down, and I will uh, I will look that out, and we can send it out. So uh, thank you. I think um, I think that. I know the data on, you know, you really want to get to them within two weeks, otherwise you're going to leave, have a lot more scarring later. And that's likely why she was stuck at 1.7 and not back down to her baseline. Um, right, that but, is uh, Spanish data on the famous two weeks. Do it then, right. forget. Uh, but there is recent information from England on their experience, as you very well know, uh, with corticosteroids again. Uh, although an RCT has never been done, most people these days will treat early on with steroids. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, clearly uh, wise in this case, uh, but I'm still not sure that we, you know, even if it is a single process of granulomatous inflammation in the bone marrow and the kidney, we still don't necessarily have a pathophysiology, a, a basic pathophysiology, whether it's, so you know, whatever sarcoid or, or or the like you know this is like this is this becomes steroid deficient uh, disease in a way you know um you know steroidpenia because i mean it's just remarkable to me how well this patient responded and i'll i'll bet that uh she was that 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 she'll do well on mmf but you don't know and that maybe if she doesn't do well on mmf there would be a consideration of rituximab i mean because you know most things that are steroid responsive that come back tend to respond to rituximab um but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say. 
Um, I don't know that it matters. I mean, it'd be nice to know what she had, I suppose, to put a label on it. But, you know, it's more important is you know what to do. And you've, you know, you've shown that you've come up with a really good plan. A um, little surprised her Cretton stated uh, 1.7. She's, a, you know, that's a lot of GFR loss for somebody, her, a woman at her age. But she had some pretty bad uh, disease there. And, and uh, we don't know exactly how, you know, we had labs, what, six months ago or something, but nothing in the interim and it could have been going on for quite a while. Bill, in retrospect, I mean, was she sick for uh, months or did she just kind of get sick quickly? No, about six weeks. It was about two weeks after she got back from her main trip. And that's why everybody was really trying to pinpoint uh, Lyme disease. Uh, and, you know, it, it seemed like the creatinine was almost too high for seven days of augmentin. It would take so much, so much longer to get up there, I think, than, you know, to, to blame that alone also. And so it, it makes sense a little bit in retrospect that it, wasn't just drug induced. Mm -hmm. I just posted the appeal paper in CJ. Jason was 2006, a way yeah. back. Yeah, I I'm going to look that up, Mario, because I, I mean, if you ask me, is there is there any possibility that such thing as steroid unresponsive interstitial nephritis that would respond to MMF? I would bet a lot of money that that is not possible. I just can't imagine. But you know. Dr. Well, Pell's yeah, Dr. Pell, and I believe it. I just would never think that could be possible. Yeah, like I said, that's the only paper I've seen in years. I haven't seen anything else. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vitti and I follow a similar patient in my practice, except she had, uh, uh, she presented with a very high rheumatoid factor, weight loss, and creatine in uh, American unit around four. And kidney biopsy showed exactly like intense uh, interstitial nephritis with some plasma cells and eels and fills. And her ACE was also normal. But what was interesting in her case, her alkaline phosphate was slightly high. So we also did the liver biopsy where granuloma was found. So in about 10% of the people, you wouldn't find granulomas. Either you miss it or they don't have granulomas in the kidney. We treat her and actually, um, sarcoidosis type of regimen with prednisone and salcept and she has remained stable for over a year now uh, and uh, I will continue to treat her because we also think she may have sarcoidosis in her liver so she will need a liver prolonged course of MMF. So this patient actually reminds me of my patient. I mean what's it's amazing to me is how fast the anemia responds. I mean anemia is not that common in sarcoid. Yeah um, in my patient the anemia was there too uh, but not that low. It was around eight, I think, eighty in our in our units, and she responded quite quickly with prednisone. And about mm. two to three weeks time, her rheumatoid factor dropped. Well, I had never seen rheumatoid factor of thirteen hundred, and it mm. dropped to about three hundred. So it, it, she reminds me exactly. But we do not know she has what kind of granulomas. But we treated her as a sarcoidosis. And I, I think it's. I think in this case, uh, you know, Steve and uh, Dick were right to point out the anemia was kind of one of the keys. I mean, her her drop in hemoglobin was so severe, and then we we see why this granuloma is there, and it's not likely allowing, you know, the patient to, you know, have erythropoiesis. And so, I, I and and responded really well once you took care of that inflammation. And so it was an unusual cause of a bone marrow suppression, but uh, it was the cause nonetheless. But I, I thought the red cell, I thought from what David said that the, the, the lineage was okay for reds, whites, and platelets. Oh. Is that not right on the bone marrow? Maybe David's off now. Oh, oh no, 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 I'm still here. Yeah, yeah, the, the lineage was, was fine on the marrow. If you remember that one of the first slides I put up is what would you do? Just treat with steroids? Would you do a bone marrow biopsy? Would you do a renal biopsy? And, uh, you know, it turns out any of those would have worked because in the end, we don't really have a unifying diagnosis. If you'd have done steroids and the patient got mm -hmm. better and then you stopped, cut the steroids, got worse, you, would, you could have restarted steroids. Because so we don't really know. I mean, the fact that you saw a granuloma, whether that's a, you know, the primary problem of some granulomatous disease or not, in the end, this is all about, you know, needing some immunosuppression. I think we've ruled out infection by now. The patient wouldn't, wouldn't be doing well. And uh, you did, you know, every test that you could possibly think of. So it is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe we should have all- but My understanding too, in for Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go. No, my understanding, you know, because this has come up many times in the past. And again, David, you can 
definitely um, it's more of a question to you but i remember mel schwartz telling granulomas in you know in, in a renal biopsy are pretty non-specific you can see them in drug induced you can see them in a lot of things so you know in, you know non-caseating granulomas i i don't know how you know i don't find that to be that specific either i know we're kind of trying to put it all together with occam's razor I don't know, maybe Hictum's dictum might fall into play here somewhere too. But but anyway, David, is I mean, granulomas per se, I mean, does yeah, that yeah, help you're, you? You're, you're exactly right, Steve. Uh, there are sometimes drug associated, sometimes sarcoidosis. Sometimes we don't find an underlying cause. You're, you're exactly right. They're not specific. I mean, vasculitis can have granulomas, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was all that was all on that slide. Um, and, and so yep. you do that appropriate workup to see what you can find. And, and you know, in some cases, it ends up being idiopathic, or maybe I mean, we're just not smart enough. Look at those two lists. It's ridiculous. I mean, you think granulomatous oh, disease would be like, oh, a few things and like what's not in there? What I process know. is not in there? And what drug is not there? It's really, you know, you're kind of left with, you know, I mean, tough. again, the amazing thing to me is still this anemia that responds so damn quickly to the antibiotic, to the uh, prednisone. I mean, to go from whatever it was, the bill showed six back up to 14. And I assume that's within a look like on the timeline, a fairly short period. That's why I keep wondering whether there's some autoimmune process here, or, you know, antibody mediated. But I'm sure, as Bill already pointed out, I, I'm sure hematology looked for, you know, warm agglutinins, uh, you know, Coombs positive hemolytic anemia, which is kind of what you would look for. And I guess that was negative, but it's amazing how quickly that anemia responds. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to be, we're going to be left with a little bit of a question here, but the good news is, is that sometimes we have a diagnosis that uh, we, we can't, can't always help here. We don't know exactly what's going on, but I don't know that it really matters that much as once you've ruled out some of the bad things, which I think has been effectively done. I think it, it's a nice management case, uh, Bill. And I think it's a lot of questions and different approaches, but I, I like the way you I like the way it played out, you know, renal biopsy treatment, bone marrow biopsy treatment, and consideration of long longer maintenance therapy, because this is clearly not something that's a lit self limiting drug. Uh, I don't think that that's that I don't buy, even though it really screamed to me of being a PPI or a, or a penicillin induced AIN. I mean, like I said, from the beginning, I was having trouble coming up with anything else. <laughs> Anyway, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, CMA activity code again is 48887. Um, we may not be on next week. Uh, Dr. Woody and I are uh, running the ASN board review course. Uh, so I think we'll probably be off next week and then we'll be back probably the week after, but we'll see. Just keep your emails up. But if you're not on okay. our email list, get a hold of one of us, uh, send us a direct message or send us an email or find us. We'll put you on the list. Please join our YouTube channel. These will all be put up on YouTube where uh, we have quite a number of them, uh, close to 100 now, I think so. Um, and do, they've now been labeled by Dr. Baxi, so you don't just find a mystery case. If you're looking for some, an interesting case of lupus or vasculitis or interstitial nephritis or something, they're kind of uh, uh, now um, by, uh, by category. Is that right, Prevere? They're categorized by uh, GN, and so we'll have, and then we have our tubular interstitial diseases too. Yeah, so it's a little better than, you know, just picking yeah, one randomly thanks. if you're looking for something. Anyway, we'll see you Thank all. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, Dick. Uh, thanks, Mario. Thanks, thanks uh, Dr. Reen, for all your comments, uh, and we'll see you soon. Stay safe, everybody.